All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Greco. I'm a computer scientist working at uh, system analysis for US Army DevCom Armament Center, located at Picatinny Arsenal, New Jersey. I'm the lead developer for a modeling and simulation tool that aids in the decision analytics of weapon systems called PRISM, which I'll be talking about today. Uh, I'm also joined by Dr. Matt Chilly, a systems engineer from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, who will be presenting the context of decision analytics in the US Army. Uh, Dr. Chile has dedicated his career to studying and improving the decision-making process used within the Department of Defense. Uh, and in past lives, Dr. Chile and I have supported multiple pro Army projects together you know, through our combined fields of supporting the decision-making process on armament systems by creating and using highly adaptive modeling and simulation tools. Next slide. So in this talk, we'll discuss uh, decision analytics as it relates to the Department of Defense and how PRISM was developed by the Armament Center to support that process through the generation of quantitative performance data. Uh, so first I'll hand it off to Matt so he can give you the context for decision analytics and how it's used within the US Army. Dr. Chile. Yeah, thanks, Mike, I appreciate it. Um, so as Mike just said, we thought we'd start this brief with just a little bit of context. And it's only a few charts here and I'm gonna dive heavy into to Mike's PRISM briefing. But our context starts with um, where we use this modeling and simulation approach. Um, and we often use it um, in the very early part of the V, in the early phases uh, where we do a lot of our system architecture, evaluation and decision-making. And it's uh, widely recognized right, that this part, this architecture decision-making is enormously important and particularly vexing. And it's really important uh, because these decisions drive the ultimate value of the system. Um, the, the, these kind of decisions have to do with function and form, and they occur very early in the system life cycle, but shortcomings introduced through uh, perhaps unwise choices in this early phase you know, can't be easily fixed um, or fix it all in, in subsequent efforts later in the phase with the detailed design phases, uh, regardless of the quality of that detailed design effort. So the architecture really drives uh, of a lot of the value uh, proposition of a system. So that's why it's important. Uh, but the decisions are also vexing um, at the, because they're highly consequential, as we just mentioned. They're highly coupled, these decisions are. Um, and they have to balance multiple objectives in the presence of uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, so that's very complex and faced with a lot of complexity that will surpass any of our cognitive limits. Uh, we often are tempted to just employ simple heuristics, oversimplify the, the problem in a way that's prone to bias or logic flaws. So what this decision framework that we're talking about today and, and the modeling and simulation approach that we're talking about specifically, um, it looks to replace these heuristics with a, a process that avoids all these pitfalls uh, and generates a, a large solution space for the architecture um, that helps explore the consequences of each potential architecture across all our measures of effectiveness and then synthesize it in a way and communicates in a way that can help decision makers find uh, rapid and thorough understanding. Uh, next chart, please, Mike. So there's been a lot of talk about decision making lately. Um, one example, uh, we can consider DOD's digital engineering strategy. And this strategy has a five point purpose statement. And the very first point, uh, that they make here, and you can read at the very top, is to formalize the development, integration, and use of models to inform enterprise and program decision making. So, you know, that's the why, at least one of the whys of digital engineering and the and the and the push there. Um, next chart, please. So the question might be why? Why is decision making difficult? And and you commonly get two responses. One, well, there's just not enough data to make an informed decision, and the other response is. Uh, I'm just flooded with too much data, and, and there's no way to to link these highly technical reports um, in a way that helps me see the whole. And so, 
we're uh, we pursue an approach that tries to answer both those um, you know, potential issues. Um, so, as we all know, what this uh, opportunities often present themselves in a somewhat ambiguous or unstructured way, and that's represented by all these question marks off in the uh, on the left hand side of this cartoon. But our, our the first step in our approach is to take some time with that unstructured set of high level objectives and recast them, recast them as a hierarchy that express the elements of stakeholder value in a highly structured way. We do this because um, it helps us coordinate, uh, uh, I think mobilize our subject matter experts uh, and their associated models in a very coordinated way and help us generate data and record it in a form that is readily synthesized at the system level to form a coherent view of the trade space. And then we can spot key patterns and trends. So this short cartoon, uh, well, I guess decision makers and analysts both benefit from this general approach. Analysts appreciate, uh, appreciate it because their data makes an impact at the, high, at the decision table and it's not accidentally overlooked or, or misunderstood. And decision makers like it because um, they can see more readily how the parts combine to create the whole. Uh, next chart, please. So this whole process can be summarized, I guess I summarize it as a mashup of a multiple objective decision analysis with a systems thinking perspective and a visual analytics approach to exploratory data analysis. And so what we hope that this does and then what we find that it does do is that it enables a value focused, quantitatively reasoned search for best value. And we describe best value as a system solution that best balances these multiple objectives which has to do like with normally performance and cost and time um, in the presence of uncertainty. And it also helps us provide a mechanism to generate compelling information visualizations to enable system architects and decision makers to interact with the data um, in a way that they can explore the trade space, develop intuition, um, and, and find patterns and trends and make decisions. So this talk, um, that, that Mike is going to give is really the foundation of this process. It's, it's at the bottom of this, of this layered view. Um, it's at the, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the bottom uh, layer uh, on the next chart. Next chart, please. So this bottom layer uh, I call an assessment flow diagram. And, and all this really does, um, um, it's really the foundation, as I said, of, of this highly structured quantitative analysis. Um, and this, this diagram links the fundamental objectives, the things we care about. So that's the top, um, that RNG kind of color. Um, these are the things we care about uh, with the things uh, that we can control. And that's the stuff in the green at the bottom. And, and they're connected through these intermediate measures, the stuff in the blue. So it connects the things we care about, the stuff at the top, this is the stakeholder value, with the stuff that we can change, and you can change the stuff from the bottom green. And in order to make that connection, we need these intermediate measures, which is really um, a, a coordinated modeling and simulation or, or testing plan. And so just a few more highlights here, the, the boxes represent decision nodes, those boxes are in the, in the green part, because these are the independent variables, these are things we can change. The yellow triangles are the assumptions um, that are needed to do our modeling and simulation, but aren't in our control. These are things like weather or things that the threat has a vote on and we don't. Um, uh, the, the blue circles are models. Um, and that's a lot of what, what Mike will be talking about today. Um, and the, the red arrows uh, between the node pairs uh, are these influences. And uh, the text on those red arrows uh, describe the data flowing on an influence arrow. So we like this diagram because it helps facilitate this cross-discipline communication. Because a lot of people, uh, a lot of the subject matter experts either live in a row at the green physical means layer, or perhaps in one of the, the columns or even one of these blue circles because um, uh, they, they own the model or the data that goes with that model. So it's a way to help facilitate this cross-discipline communication, clarify the cause and effect relationships, and, and actually reveal the complexity and interrelationship into relationships between these architecture and design variables. And, um, and what we're gonna talk about today is how it, it structures this quantitative modeling effort that, and this blue space in the middle is really dominated um, by, by Mike's prism model, which, uh, which really brings us to that, the heart of the, 
of the briefing. Uh, Mike, next chart, please. So, so this, although there are cost and, and schedule models in this blue section, most of it is dominated by, um, you know, weaponeering kind of models, uh, the, the systems analysis models. Uh, and this is really what uh, Mike's gonna talk about, the state-of-the-art modeling and simulation framework called PRISM, Performance Related Integrated Suite of Models developed by CCDCAC. So let me turn this back over to Mike Greco so he can unpack PRISM for us. Mike, it's all yours. Thank you, Matt. So as Matt's shown, the decision-making process you know, has a need for a vast amount of quantitative data. Uh, data is needed for you know, cost, schedule, uh, risk, and especially system performance uh, in order to help uh, decision-makers make those informed decisions. Uh, so about six years ago in the systems analysis division at Armin Center, we start running into an issue where our computing resources were growing. <clears throat> we got our first high performance cluster computer online, uh, but you know, our models were kind of lacking in the capability to actually use those resources. A lot of the models we had at that time were developed in uh, to really to accomplish specific goals and were typically written in somewhat difficult to work with languages. Uh, so it became uh, harder and harder to retrofit those models with new capabilities or really just to get them on the HPCs in general. Uh, and each model really presented its, its unique set of challenges in working with it uh, just to get them to run smoothly for, for newer type of architectures. You know, so we decided to develop a framework that would help us run simulations in uh, many different operating environments. And that framework became known as PRISM. So PRISM stands for Performance Related and Integrated Suite of Models. It is a lightweight, fast uh, modeling and simulation framework written in modern day C++. Uh, PRISM at its core is a set of functions, classes, objects uh, that really facilitate the development, integration, and execution of system-based models in a time-stepped virtual environment. Prism incorporates a small set of industry-proven uh, libraries that aid in the creation of model codes, such as the Eigen Linear Algebra Library, <coughs> the ISI, ASIO Library for Asynchronous Networking. Um, you know, and, and Prism employs a series of abstraction layers that really help provide that modular interaction between different types of models. Um, in the dyna dynamic scenarios. And then working outward in our Prism Onion here, uh, you know, we integrate subject matter expert developed models, which are typically written in MATLAB or Simulink, some other environments um, that are then uh, reusable for other analysis. And then finally, Prism interfaces with external systems as well. Uh, you know, that includes tying into larger operational sims where there's, you know, many on many type of actors in the simulation. And also uh, through the networking, uh, we've also tied into physical tactical systems, providing that hardware in the loop uh, capability as well. Having PRISM be modular was extremely important to all these stakeholders involved in the development of PRISM. Um, every model that plugs into the PRISM framework is compiled and built as a dynamically loaded library. Uh, so it's a DLL on Windows or uh, .so on Linux. And through the system of dynamically loading functionality, uh, coupled with the highly scriptable XML input interface, PRISM is able to reuse and repurpose the models that are built for it uh, to accomplish different, goal different goals. Some of the different types of weapons-based models uh, that are typically integrated or developed uh, include uh, movement models, you know, which can be ground movement models, uh, you know, ballistic flight models, or smart munition six-off type models. Uh, there's also fusing and warhead models, uh, lethality and vulnerability models, and also sensor models, uh, to name a few. And because we have this library of SMEED developed uh, functionality uh, that we're then able to mix and match, PRISM is able to rapidly develop uh, system performance prototypes. Uh, so this enables analysis teams to develop large trade spaces and run millions of Monte Carlo simulations uh, 
to help find those optimal design influencers. So here are the three main capability spokes of the PRISM engine. Uh, the first is the ability to act as a model development platform. Uh, through those uses of the abstraction layers, those algebraic libraries, uh, you know, source control, and inter interoperability libraries, uh, weapon systems analysts and developers can create system models uh, directly in the PRISM uh, software development kit. The second is integration. You know, if the model was developed external to PRISM, say for instance, in uh, MATLAB or Simulink or Fortran, or you know, if we're lucky, C or C++, uh, PRISM provides those integration hooks that facilitate the wrapping of those system models into the PRISM functional codes. <clears throat> and then arguably the most important spoke uh, the ability to run those developed or integrated models. Uh, PRISM was written in cross-platform portable C++, you know, which allows our developers and analysts the ability to take those models and that framework code and run simulations on standard Windows or Linux machines, but then take that and run that directly on specialized machines like the high-performance cluster computers, or even real-time interrupt-based architectures. And through this modular ecosystem of flexible development, integration, and execution of system models, uh, Prisma has enabled the Ar Armin Center the ability to quickly iterate on weapon system design activities by providing you know, up-to-date lethality and effectiveness estimates into the decision analytics process. Through this iterative process that traverses from decision makers to design engineers to performance analysts, and then back to decision makers, the Armin Center is able to rapidly prototype weapon system functionality, starting with lower fidelity representations of system components, but then iterating over the design space building insights into which design aspects might provide the best performance, and then adding higher fidelity models when appropriate in order to provide stakeholders with the best set of quantitative performance estimates available. So I wanna give two uh, quick examples of how PRISM is used uh, traditionally to help uh, shape ARM and system development. Uh, the first example is a trade space exploration in this notional example, the performance analyst is helping the program management team uh, decide which fuse vendor uh, to select for the integration into the full up uh, munition system. So the PRISM modeler can work with the different vendors. Uh, so in this case, vendors A, B, C, and D uh, in order to integrate their fusing models into PRISM. You know, whether that model is a, a black box uh, due to some IP concerns or say a, a fully open white box or e even somewhere in between uh, as a gray box. It's really up to the vendor and the contracting mechanisms that are in place. Um, but the Prism analysts can then take those integrated models and those and, and build scenarios with that and then execute uh, large Monte Carlo analysis uh, on the integrated system. Um, and see how well it performs in persecuting uh, a target. So, so in this example, the full up integrate system would can, uh, consist of the weapon, say the flight model, the warhead, and then the fuse that's in question here. And now because PRISM is repeatable, the differences in the sets of data that are generated uh, you know, can be attributed to the, the only differences in the simulation, uh, which really is that, that fusing uh, that fusing model. And now we've developed a set of data that the PM can, can then use to justify the selection of uh, the appropriate fuse vendor uh, when combined with the other types of data, such as the cost and, and the schedule. Another uh, different but also useful way PRISM has been used uh, is to act as a test scene generation system for tactical physical hardware. 
Prism can emulate threat and environmental aspects uh, that can stimulate tactical systems in real time. Uh, in this mode, Prism was used to assess the mission outcome after the tactical system processed the virtual environments uh, stimulations that Prism was providing. Uh, you know, it was used to simulate the flying out of countermeasures and the bursting of warheads. And then Prism would then assess, you know, whether or not the tactical system was able to complete its mission, you know, with a success or a failure. Um, you know, some of the benefits here were the test team was able to set up a large variety of tests quickly and repeatedly, all within the hardware in the loop laboratory. Um, and, you know, this also had a huge benef cost benefit to the management team, uh, you know, since the system could be tested and bugs could be found and then fixed and taken care of all before that system was taken out to the field, uh, you know, for an actual field test where things are actually detonating and blowing up. Um, and then also a lot of data uh, was able to be captured within the system, uh, which we were then able to feed into a 3D game environment. Uh, where we were able to watch back the different events in the simulations and then build, uh, it really communicates to the senior leaders, you know, why they were seeing the results that they were seeing and help tell that story. So getting to the end here. Um, so, you know, just to wrap up with what PRISM is and how it's used to help inform the decision analysis process. Um, again, PRISM is a modeling and simulation framework that facilitates the development, integration, and execution of system-based models. It enables a paradigm of quickly executing system simulation prototypes in dynamic environments uh, in order to help generate that quantitative performance data that's needed for the decision analytics process. Performance data is then combined with other data, such as schedule, cost, and risk data, uh, just name a few, in a logical way that helps decision makers uh, make those informed decisions on you know, Army programs. PRISM has been used to support a wide range of US armament systems from domains like indirect fire, direct fire, uh, air defense, anti-personnel, area denial, <clears throat> and also special projects that don't really fit nicely into you know, those traditional categories. Um, that's actually one of its strong points that it's, it's able to adapt and meet those new novel concepts that uh, decision makers really need to analyze. It also runs on a variety <clears throat> of machine types. So modelers are able to take uh, really use their everyday computers, uh, their email machines to develop simulations, but then take those simulations and those codes to specialized hardware in order to run those millions and millions of Monte Carlo simulations in order to help build that statistical confidence in those results. And finally, PRISM is fully government developed and controlled uh, and we're constantly evolving the framework's capabilities in order to meet weapon system analysis challenges. And that brings me to the end. Uh, just wanna say thanks once again for letting Matt and I, you know, talk to you a little bit about decision analytics and, and how it's supported with our, our PRISM tool here. Thanks again, everybody.